Maui Technology Education and Outreach Specialist, and so one of part of my job is the pleasure of putting together these public talks uh, for the community. This uh, this month we have Dr. Klaus Kiel, or sorry, Klaus Kyle. Sorry. Kyle from Kiel or Kiel from Kyle? You never one know. Of the two. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, he's uh, an expert research on uh, research in solid matter in the solar nebula, so of the sort of planetary or the pre-solar uh, system, and the evolution of that material, uh, including the Moon and Mars, and he has a wide variety of interests that he, I'm sure he will fill you in on. The, on. Uh, his PhD is from Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. Uh, he is specializing in min mineralogy and, and geochemistry. He's had a number of positions, uh, Frederick Schiller University, Max Planck Institute, UC San Diego, NASA Ames, University of New Mexico, and then the University of Hawaii at Manoa was lucky enough to attract him here, where he is currently uh, in the Planet Geosciences Division. Uh, his accolades uh, are too long to list. For a while, he was getting two to three a year, and then they really started taking off. But there were there are two that I uh, kind of want. He's he's been on this who's who list. Um, but he was also been, was the president of the Hawaii Academy of Sciences, uh, and I'll also mention that he has well published over 660 publications that I noticed at last count and and growing. So if we can all give him a warm Maui welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your uh, introduction, and thank you all for inviting me, uh, Jeff Kuhn and uh, Mike and Gary. Uh, I'm, this is my first visit here, and I'm really quite impressed what you've built up in those short years, and this building is just terrific, so congratulations. Over the last uh, several decades, uh, cosmochemists, and I'm one of them, have made enormous progress in understanding the early history of our solar system. Questions like, when did our solar system form? How fast did the baby planets that were, that formed eventually the bigger planets, how fast did they form? And did our solar system inherit material from outside the solar system? These are all very basic and big questions, and I will tell you about those today very briefly and hopefully at a level where non-meteoritists, non-cosmochemists can follow me. But since most of you probably know very little about meteorites, I thought I should give you a very brief introduction in what meteorites are. So without any further ado, meteorites are defined as solid bodies of extraterrestrial material that penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, reach its surface, and are recovered. And we distinguish between falls and finds. A fall is an observed event. A find is a random recovery. A farmer may find one uh, on his field without a record of the fall. They're given names based on where they were found. For example, Hawaii, although it's a very small target area, actually has had two meteorites hit us. The first one, when the missionaries had come here, just after a few years later, in 1825, that's the Honolulu meteorite, and then in 1949, Pololo Valley, a meteorite fell on the roof of a house, penetrated the roof, penetrated the ceiling, and hit a young boy sleeping in his bed. Oh Nothing happened, however. Okay, where do meteorites come from? I like to call them the poor men's space probes. They come to us without us doing anything about it. They fall, and we don't have to spend millions or millions and millions of dollars to go out and collect them. Uh, where do they come from? This is the fascinating thing. We learned this only in the last 10 years. 66 of the meteorites in our collections are actually impact ejected rocks from Earth Moon. Additional Apollo landing sites, 66 separate events. Most likely, since these are random impacts, many happened on the far side of the moon, which we've never sampled. Very fascinating. We've learned a great deal about the moon from that. And perhaps even more astonishing is 
that 55 meteorites in our collections are impact ejected rocks from the planet Mars. We've never brought a sample back from Mars. We've landed spacecraft there, but we've never brought a rock back. So we've learned a tremendous amount from studying these meteorites in our laboratories. Now, most meteorites, well over 25,000, are impact produced fragments of what we call asteroids. These are small baby planets. The largest one in the sky today is 600 miles in diameter, and they orbit in principle between the orbits of the planets Mars and Jupiter, just like little planets around the Sun. My talk today will deal with asteroidal meteorites because I like to call them the Rosetta Stones of the solar system because the properties of these asteroidal meteorites tell us how our solar system came about, when it formed, how it evolved, etc., etc. Most of this data comes from the study of meteorites. Now, asteroidal meteorites come from asteroids. Until very recently, about 10 years ago or so, we didn't know what asteroids looked like because they're so far away and they're tiny. Even with the best telescopes, you can't get a close-up picture. But luckily, we had some very successful uh, spacecraft, among others the NEAR spacecraft, named after Near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous Mission, which visited uh, the asteroid Eros in the year 2000. This is this object, 31 kilometers in longest dimension. And you see it looks like a potato, doesn't it? I mean, huge craters, um, remarkably large craters, a regolith, fine-grained material on the surface. Very, very fascinating. Now, m meteorites have fallen on the Earth ever since the Earth formed. But man did not know until relatively recently where they came from. They didn't know what to do with meteorites, but men being curious recorded these meteorite falls very carefully. This is one of the oldest preserved meteorites that, was, that fell November 16, 1492 at Ensisheim in Elsa's Lorraine. You see this depiction here coming out of clouds. In those days, people thought meteorites come from the atmosphere like hail. Not so. And here you see the city of Ensisheim, the medieval uh, our, uh, 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 wall of the, of the city. So people recorded these falls. Here is a contemporary painting of that fall. Even though they didn't know it, they recorded it and they preserved it. Here is a picture of a written rec record from those days describing the event, what was observed, and what had happened. And even today, there is a club in Ensisheim called the Friends of Ensisheim, of the Ensisheim meteorite, and they meet periodically and they discuss and they are proud of their meteorites. <laughs> and I'm sure, judging from this guy, they drink a lot of beer and they eat a lot, you know, so. This is the Ensisheim meteorite. It's a beautiful, beautiful contritic meteorite. Now, things changed when a German scientist by the name of Klackney, this is when he lived, was the first to recognize that meteorites actually are not like hail, come from the atmosphere, but they come from space. And since then, of course, a revolution has taken place in the field of cosmochemistry and meteoritics because people recognized how important it is to study these uh, messengers from space. We didn't know until about 30 years ago, where they actually came from, that they came from asteroids. That was unknown. So Clinton uh, did very important work. My colleagues and I named in his honor a new mineral, a sodium calcium magnesium phosphate, which we discovered in the cold, uh, iron meteorite, a, a mineral unknown from Earth after Clatney. If he had lived, he would have been overjoyed, of course. <laughs> but uh, it's still good to honor a man like this. Now, where do these meteorites come from? I, I, I was, of course, they're found all over the world. But in the last 20 years, a real treasure house for finding meteorites have been the Antarctic, a cold desert, and also in recent years, hot deserts, like the Sahara. Here is a picture of the Antarctic continent. And these thin lines are the elevations, three kilometers above sea level, two kilometers, one kilometer above sea level. And the ice 
flows actually several miles thick flows from the pole to the coast and these lines that you see here are the flow lines the directions of flow and of course meteorites fall all over the Antarctic they're buried in the ice and right piggyback they're buried in there as right piggyback along as the ice moves towards the coast and when these ice masses reach a noon attack or a mountain range they become stagnate and there are enormous winds blowing in the Antarctic you know 50 60 70 miles per hour is not unusual and that wind erodes the ice away and the ice coughs up the meteorites and they sit on the surface and you just go there and pick them up here's an example of some of my colleagues were part of this search for meteorites in the Antarctic this was in the Austral summer of 1992 1993 I'm not there I, I, I like warm climates I don't want to go where it's that cold uh, and it's called the Antarctic search for meteorites or ANSMET for short and you see here of course they're easily visible black meteorites fusion crust is black that forms when the meteorite comes through the atmosphere sitting on that white ice you know it's it's easy to to pick up and of course they have been preserved some of them have resided in the ice for as long as a million years. We can determine that by determining the terrestrial age. But many of them are only a few thousands of years old, and so they are very fresh. They're preserved in ice in deep freeze. So we can study them and, of course, learn a great deal from them. The more meteorites you have, the more likely it is that you find unusual types, lunar meteorites, Martian meteorites, etc. And that program has helped tremendously. It's supported by the National Science Foundation, by NASA and the Smithsonian. It's a rough deal. To, it's, I hear one of your people goes to the Antarctic all the time, right? Uh, you know, these people sleep in these tents two at a time for six weeks without a shower. I mean, I cannot imagine doing that. But they tell me they don't smell because it's so dry there. You know, it's so cold and so dry. Well, I'd rather go to Maui. <laughs> okay, now you might ask, how big are meteorites that fall on our planet? Now there is a limit to the size of a meteorite that can survive the impact. You know, in space, there are many kilometers, many miles in diameter, but as they come through the atmosphere, only the small ones are being slowed down by the atmosphere due to friction. They fall like a rock from an airplane. The big ones hit with 15 kilometers a second, 10 mile per second velocity and they cause an explosion. So an explosion crater forms. So there's a limit to the size of a meteorite that can survive an impact on our planet. This is the biggest one. Of course it's one made out of iron because iron is much more uh, solid and uh, than, than rocky material. This one is in, no, still in the place where it was found in South Africa called the Hoba meteorite and weighs 60 tons so if you don't want to be near near the fall like that here's another interesting one that I like very much this one is actually in the United States it is in the uh, American Museum of Natural History in the Ross Hall of meteorites if you ever have a chance to go to New York you must see this thing it weighs 31 tons and is sitting on a pedestal now in the Ross Hall the, uh, the columns that, uh, upon which this meteorite sits go all the way through the basement into the, the soil, into the rock, because, you know, it's so incredibly heavy. The story about the meteorite is that it was recovered, found and recovered by Admiral Perry, the famous American explorer, around uh, at the end of the 19th century, and how this guy and his crew got a third piece of metal onto that sailing vessel is, is beyond me. So, fascinating story. Now, luckily, most meteorites uh, that fall on the Earth are relatively small. Uh, I know of only one, the little boy in uh, Palolo Valley was not hit, it hit his bed. I know of only one case where a meteorite actually hit a person. 
and that happened in 1954 uh, in Sulacaga, Alabama. Sulacaga, Alabama. It was an ordinary country, right? But it, imagine, it lay, weighed about 12 pounds. And it hit the roof, crashed through the ceiling, and hit Mrs. Hotchis, who was taking an afternoon nap on the thigh, and made a sizable bruise. So I wouldn't want to be hit by something like that. That's very rare, as I say. I have only one <laughs> record that this actually happened. Now, buildings and other obstacles are more frequently hit. Here is uh, a woman by the name of Michelle Knapp, and he, she parked her car in Peekskill, New York, outside her house uh, at night and went into the house, and in the middle of the night she woke up and heard that enormous crash. And she thought, oh, boy, here, here goes that neighbor boy again, banging into my car. Well, she walked outside, and lo and behold, this is what that car looked like. But luckily, this was not the neighbor boy. It actually was a meteorite. This is the meteorite. Black fusion crust on the outside that forms when the meteorite comes to the atmosphere and uh, gets melts, basically, on the very surface, and the interior is white. These people were very enterprising. They took that damaged car and the meteorite and what went all across the U.S. to mineral exhibits and mineral shows and actually made money off it. So, <laughs> make, sorry? Yeah, yeah. The, the law in the United States is that the meteorite belongs to the landowner. So if you have a meteorite that falls on your land, it's yours. If it falls on federal land, you have to take it, put it on your lot, and then say it's mine. Okay, so much for an introduction. And now a little bit more science. Uh, I promised you I would tell you about the age of the solar system, which we have determined from determining the ages of the constituents of meteorites. I wanted to tell you how fast the solar system formed, how fast these little uh, baby planets, which became the embryos of the bigger planets, accreted to make bigger planets, how fast they formed, and that there is material in these meteorites that comes from outside our solar system and is actually older than our solar system. Imagine that. Incredible. Now, in order for you to follow me, I have to tell you that there is, in principle, two types of asteroids. Those which have retained their original makeup. We call them the primitive or undifferentiated asteroids from which they come. Those are called the chondritic meteorites. The name is chondrites, named after these round things that they, that they contain, which are called chondrules. They may, these rocks may have been a little bit heated. They may have been altered by water, because when these asteroids formed, you know, ice was incorporated in them as well. So there is a little bit of that. But some of them are absolutely beautiful, pristine, just like they were when the solar system was put together. And from those, we can determine how old our solar system is. And we do this by measuring basically two materials. This, incidentally, is a thin section of one of those meteorites. Here's the scale. Here's a thin section in transmitted light. This is an image in x-rays. We scan an x-ray beam across, record magnesium, calcium, and aluminum radiation and assign colors to it and then put them one on top of the other and so you get a map and that shows that these so-called calcium aluminum rich inclusions CAIs, please remember that terminology, are made up of a lot of calcium green and a lot of alumina, uh, aluminum blue. This material are the contours, these round things, and they are largely made up of magnesium silicates. Those are the important materials that, as I will show you, have retained their properties in some meteorites like they were at the dawn of the solar system. And that's an incredible thing. And so when we date them, we basically date how old our world is. Okay? The other type of asteroid started out like these contrites, but radioactive uh, elements 
heated and melted them. Now, you probably have learned in school that our own planet has a core of iron, a mantle of magnesium-rich material, and a crust. The crust is basalt, like you see all over here uh, on Maui. That's what is called a differentiated planet. It melted, the heavy stuff sank into the core, the light stuff got to the surface. The same happens, happened in some asteroids. The ones that melted, we call them, I'm sorry, we call them uh, differentiated and fractionated asteroids. And here are some images of rocks from the very crust of a broken up asteroid, basalts, not unlike what you see here in Hawaii. There's a difference. There's not a trace of water in these things. Earth basalts have all water. This is completely dry material. Never mind these names, but you see, they're absolutely beautiful to look at in the microscope. Now, the mantle material in asteroids, here is one example from a uraeolite. And if you can remember this name, because I get back to it, because we dated this thing. It consists of carbon in here, a lot of little diamonds are in here, and then silicates. And this comes from the mantle, so one layer down from the crust. And then at the boundary between the mantle and the metal core are rocks that consist, this is a picture in transmitted light illuminated from the back. This is metal, so you don't see anything. And this is a mineral called olivine or peridot. You find that here on beaches in Hawaii, you know, the green mineral. The scale to this thing is about, this is about two inches across. And we think these stony irons, this one is called a palisite, probably come from the core mental boundary of a broken up asteroid. And then when you go into the very core, you find iron meteorites. Here's an example. This thing is about, this is about an inch in diameter. This is a, sil a sulfide inclusion. So that's the broken up core of an asteroid. And this structure here allows us, by complex methods, to determine how fast this thing cooled. And since this metal cooled inside a shell of silicates, we can actually calculate from the cooling rate how big the parent asteroid might have been. The cooling rate of something like this is about 10 degrees per million years. So <laughs> uh, you cannot make a better steel on this planet because you don't have time to let it cool so slowly. And those things, uh, uh, and at a rate of 10 degrees per million, per million years, depending upon what you assume for the thermal conductivity and so forth of the rock, says that they come from parent bodies, asteroids, about 100 kilometers in radius. So there were baby planets. They were not huge. Uh, but they are very important in the history of our solar system because bodies like this were the ones that accreted, came together, and formed things like the Earth. Metal was already there. These things were remelted. The metal got into the core of the Earth. That's this is how come we have a metal core. OK. Now determining the age of these materials. I wanted to tell you about the measurements of age, which our colleagues and we have done of the CAIs, these calcium aluminum rich inclusions, of contrules and of one of those rocks that formed the mantle, formed from like a volcanic rock, melt formed from a melt. This diagram shows very simply how one uses the radioactive a radioactive decay of elements to determine the age of the rock. We can determine the age of anything in our world because all the materials contain radioactive elements, your body, rocks, etc. Turns out that the element potassium, in fact, an isotope of potassium with a mass of 40, never mind the details, decays into <laughs> a gas Argon, a noble gas, also of the mass of 40. And the half-life is 1,250 million years. That is, if you had a one ounce of potassium-40 after 1,250 million years, half of it would have decayed into argon, and half of it would have to retain, and so on. 
And so by measuring these isotopes, you can determine how long this decay has taken place. This is using long-lived radionuclides, millions of years for the half-life. I'll show you next that we also use very short-lived radionuclides that have very, very short lives to actually do much more accurate and much more decisive measurements of these rocks. Now here is a diagram that shows you how this works. Let's assume, this is very simplified, that you started out with a rock that originally had this amount of potassium-40. We don't use the absolute amounts, we always ratio that into a stable isotope. Argon-36 is stable. So the 40 to Argon-36 ratio at the time of the birth of this rock was this. As time went on, argon-40 was produced, and so potassium-40 got less and less and less, and at a particular time, you had this much argon-40 from, and this much potassium-40 left. That line, the slope of this line, gives us the age. Sounds very simple. In practice, it's a lot more complicated, but that is the principle of how one determines the age uh, of a, a rock, a meteorite, uh, with long-lived radionuclides. Here are the results. These long-lived radionuclides allow us, and there are many others, lead, uh, uranium, etc., allow us to determine very precisely today, and you have to realize what analytical finesse is required to make these measurements allows us to determine the age of these things. This is a hand specimen of a meteorite called Allende, never mind. These are the contours. And you saw this, this picture before. This is a CAI, a calcium aluminum rich inclusion. This is a CAI in this X-ray image. And my colleagues, this is a colleague of mine at the institute in, uh, at Manoa, they determined the age of the CAIs to be, look at this, 4,567.4 plus minus 0.5 million years. That is, the error in something that is 4.5 billion years old is only a half a million years. It is astonishing. And this is a development that happened in the last 10 years or so. That was not possible before. The fascinating story is, so, in terms of the age of the solar system, the very first material that formed when our solar system formed from a proto-solar uh, proto cloud, a molecular cloud, is 4.567 billion years old. That's the first material that formed and eventually accreted to form bigger planets. The controls from the same meteorites are 4,564.7 billion years old. When you subtract this from that, it means controls, in this case, formed 2.7 million years after the formation of the very first material. Now, you have to realize, imagine a solar nebula, a huge disk with a proto-sun in the center, and out here, materials condensing from the gas. The calcium aluminum rich inclusions formed 2.7 million years before the controls. You had to store these things separate from the contours for 2.7 million years before you mix them up into this planetesimal. We have no idea how this in detail would have worked. Very fascinating result. Now, in order to actually do even more precise measurements, we use isotopes with very short half-lives. And we use an instrument that is called an I, oops, I'm sorry, it always happens to me with this thing. Uh, we use an instrument called an ion microprobe. Uh, this instrument I purchased for $3.8 million. So this kind of research is not cheap. The Keck Foundation contributed to this one and a half million. Uh, NASA contributed one and a half million and the University of Hawaii gave me one million plus two positions to run that instrument. This guy is a Japanese who is an absolute genius who I hired, who is in charge of the, the lab. 
This instrument is used to determine these short-lived radionuclides. How does it work? I have a schematic diagram here that shows you how this works. Very simple. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have an iron gun that is sort of like a light bulb, uh, you know, with the tungsten, bullet, except the ions that are being admitted here are accelerated to 10,000 electron volts for A polished, I am sorry, a polished sample that is placed in this place. And since these ions have very high energy, they sputter ions off the surface that your one micron beam hits. And those ions are characteristic of what's in the sample. So if you have iron in there, you get iron ions. If you have nickel, you get nickel ions. We take those into a very complex magnetic system called a mass spectrometer that can separate these, ice, these uh, elements on the basis of their mass. We can separate iron 60 from iron 59, etc., etc. This magnet here weighs six tons. Now, I know astronomers deal with big, heavy things, telescopes. For us, this was really a challenge. We had to hire a company to bring the, it was flown in from France. Kamika makes that instrument, and it's only the, there's only two of them in the United States. They flew this in on an airplane, and we hired a company, if you can believe it, for $75,000 to bring this, these parts from the airport to the University of Hawaii. This was an expert company. They knew what they were doing, nothing. Well, the first thing they did is they dropped one of the crates off the loading dock. <laughs> Luckily, nothing had happened, but uh, it was very trying. What can we do with an instrument like this? We can determine most elements, and not only elements, but also the isotopes. Now, I have to explain what an isotope is. In this room, you live because you inhale oxygen. Oxygen, the oxygen molecules here have actually different masses. One of them has the mass, atomic mass of 16, the other of 17, the other of 18. And the ratio is constant throughout the world in terms of the ratios of 16 to 17 to 18. That's called an isotope. It's the same element, but has a different mass. And we can determine with this instrument the isotopes in micron-sized, tiny little object, uh, objects with this micron-sized beam. And of course, the purpose of this is that these isotopes allow us to determine the age just like long-lived radionuclides. Here, we use short-lived radionuclides. It's amazing that we have now achieved the precision for measuring, for example, oxygen isotopes, as I just told you, like in conventional uh, mass spectrometers where you need several hundred milligrams of samples. We do this in a micron-sized spot. Absolutely incredible. And the, the exciting thing is, of course, that since it's done in a polished section, the context of the minerals is preserved. You know, you don't grind things up, you don't make a powder. Beautiful, beautiful technique. We have people from all over the country come and use our instrument for money. If you want to use it, you're welcome to $1,000 a day, okay? <laughs> That's cheap, actually, you know, considering this is a $3.8 million instrument. Okay, we have used, for example, short-lived isotopes. This is a little tricky here, but I'll try to make that as understandable as I can. Uh, manganese and chromium. Manganese of the mass of 53 decays into chromium of the mass of 53, and the half-life is 3.7 million years. Remember, potassium was 1.2 billion. This is now only a few million. So we have a final scale to determine the ages. Uh, we determined the manganese ratio, this is the critical thing that is a measure of the age, for this uraelite. Remember the uraelite? That's a mental rock formed from a melt to be 2.84. Now that alone doesn't give you the age. You have to anger this to some other object 
where you know the manganese ratio and the absolute age. Turns out Luke Meyer and Shukul Yukov in La Jolla determined both manganese ratios and lead lead age for this particular meteorite. And so we compared this ratio to this ratio, and knowing the absolute age, we came to the conclusion that this rock, which formed in a differentiated asteroid from a melt that was produced by heating up that asteroid, was actually four, ah, 4 point, 4.38 plus minus 0.18 million years, million years older than this rock. So that is to say, if you add 4.38 to 4.558, you get an age for that particular uraelite of 4,562 million years. Why am I so excited about it? Remember that the sea ice, the very first samples that formed at the dawn of our solar system are 4.567 billion years old, and the contours formed at an age of four, uh, formed 4.564 billion years ago. If you subtract this age for the uraelite, that volcanic rock, if you so will, from the most primitive materials we have, it turns out the, that's the age of this rock, that is the melting, the differentiation, and the cooling of the asteroid from which this mantle rock came from took place only 4.5 million years after the very first material formed in the solar system, the CAIs, and only 1.8 million after the contours formed. Now what does it say? It says the solar system began at 4.567 billion years. The stuff accreted, some of the asteroids were heated very, very rapidly. Silicates, metal formed cores, silicates formed a mantle, formed basaltic rocks, and the stuff cooled. You have to cool it before you can, uh, before the, uh, the radioactive clock becomes settled. And all this happened only four and a half million years after the time our solar system came about. The bottom line of all that is, our solar system is very, very ancient. 4.567 billion years ago is when the first material formed. But these differentiated asteroids, these embryos that eventually formed the big planets, formed within a few million years of time zero. It means the, the solar system is terribly old, but it was put together in a great hurry. Someone was in a great hurry. I don't know if you can understand my excitement for these results, <laughs> because this is really, I mean, cutting edge type work. So now you know when our solar system was born, now you know how fast it was put together. And I wanted to mention one other thing, and that is an incredible discovery was made a few years ago, and one of my colleagues is still working in this field very actively, and that is in these chondritic meteorites, which have never been heated, material has been found which we can identify as not having formed from that solar nebula from which the rest of the, our world formed, but it was material that came in from other stars. We call these objects pre-solar grains. They are older than the solar system. Unfortunately, we can't determine their precise age, but they clearly are older. Some of these materials, typical so pre-solar grains, are diamond, graphite, silicon carbide, corundum, which is aluminum oxide, spinel, which is magnesium aluminum oxide, titanium carbide. Here's an example. This is one micron, the width of a hair or less. Uh, this thing is a graphite grain, and these grains in here are pre-solar titanium carbide. This is from Staudemann's work. How do we know this stuff is not from our solar system? How do we know 
it's from yet another star. Imagine we have dust in our solar system that came from different stars. I mean, this is mind blow, blowing. Well, we know that, for example, based on the oxygen isotopes that I mentioned before. Oops, I, I, these things are very nerve wracking. Okay, this is a plot of the ratio. Remember, I told you oxygen here in this room had three isotopes 16, 17, and 18. And conventionally, we plot oxygen 16 over 17 versus 16 over 18, for example. This little area here, I don't know, those of you that are close can probably see that rectangle here. This is magnified. This is where, this is from Larry Nittlow's dissertation, this is where the oxygen isotopes of our solar system falls. All the isotopes that have ever been measured of solar system material fall into this tiny little area. When you look at these pre-solar grains, for example, calcium aluminum, in calcium aluminate, I'm sorry, pre-solar oxides and pre-solar graphite, the red and the blue, you notice how they spread out. Their oxygen isotopic composition is a thousand times, 10,000 times different from our own solar system material. No way these things could have formed in the solar system. They must have formed in different stars where the process of nucleosynthesis, making of the elements, was totally different from our own planet. And this is fascinating not only because we can say we have pre-solar material here, we can determine, for example, very precisely their isotopic makeup. And theoretical astrophysicists that make models of the evolution of stars use our data as ground truth in their models. They can test their models and say, oh, sorry, my model is wrong because it actually should go this way and that. So that's been a wonderful and beautiful area of research combining interactions between cosmochemists like myself and astrophysicists. So those are these three incredible discoveries that I wanted to share with you. And let's talk a little bit about the big picture. What's the big picture? You and I are here today. Maybe this actually should be upside down. This is where we are today. Formation of our solar system, very precisely known. The CAIs, 4.56 billion years, controls a few million years younger, and the melded asteroids, maybe even a few million, more million years younger. So the solar system formed a long time ago, but the little embryos that formed the bigger planets were put together in a great hurry. Our solar system, as you probably all know, as people interested in astronomy, is part of the Milky Way galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy formed about 10,000 years ago. So our solar system is middle-aged as far as the history of the, uh, our galaxy is concerned. And of course, the Big Bang, which formed the universe, uh, formed approximately 13,700 13, million years ago. These numbers are not precisely known, not like these, because we have it easier. We have material left over, fossils left over from the time all this came about. And so finally, here is the big picture put together. <laughs> How did our world form? Well, most of you know that elements, magnesium, iron, calcium, chromium, manganese, and so forth, form in the interiors of stars, largely in big stars, HEB stars, supernovae, by nuclear processes. In other words, hydrogen combines with hydrogen, makes helium, helium combines with others, and makes heavier elements. This is what happens in stars. Red giants, for example, this is very simplified, okay? And in supernova. Now, like everything on this, in this world, these stars have a limited lifetime. They blow up, they decay. And when they decay, they spew their material, all the elements, including solid material, which we eventually find as pre-solar grains, into interstellar space from supernovae, from red giants, etc., etc. And they form very 
cold molecular clouds, clouds of gas with some dust in them. And these clouds live in interstellar space and once in a while parts of this molecular cloud contracts, collapse, collapses, forms a disk, material in the interior becomes very hot and forms a star. So our solar system formed from such a molecular cloud and formed a, pre, a proto sun, the original sun, and then the planets outward, where it, the material got hotter, got colder as you go away from the sun. Asteroids formed at the same time. Meteorites, fragments of asteroids, come to us in the form of meteorites, and we study these things and can actually identify in them these pre-solar grains, which came from supernova red giants. They have survived, imagine that, 4.5 billion years of solar system history. In absolutely incredible. And in the olden days, you see, uh, this is an old slide here. Uh, meteorites were dissolved in acids, and the leftover had the pre-solar grains in it, and you look for pre-solar grains. We now do this in an ion microprobe. It's much more elegant. This is like looking for a needle in a haystack by burning the haystack, you see. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very brief introduction into what meteorites are like and what you can learn from them, and it's been absolutely an amazing journey. I, I got into meteorite research in 57 when the Russians launched the Sputnik. And in those days, nobody worked on meteorites. And I thought, here is the satellite going around. Somehow, space science must become important. And what better to study than the rocks that come to us for free? And that's when I got started, and I got my PhD in 61. Thank you very much. asking someone who knows nothing about okay, that. Okay, so the Big Bang really is then geared only for our solar system? No, no, for, for the universe. universe. Our universe. Okay, for yeah. The astronomers would be able to tell okay. you what happened before the Big Bang. I personally don't understand the Big Bang. You know, you have to be a theoretical physicist or an astrophysicist to really understand what's going on. I mean, from nothing you created, energy you created, elementary particles, you know, first uh, very simple electrons eventually, atoms and hydrogen and helium, and uh, eventually formed galaxies and stars, and then the, the cycle began. So maybe one of the astronomers can so, answer that. So that, okay, then it comes into the solar system, to our solar system. <coughs> and uh, I mean, our, um, I'm just trying to figure out this molecular club and coming back more recently. Now, see, this all happened prior to 4.5 billion years ago, okay? These stars formed perhaps at the dawn or shortly after our Milky Way formed. And they lived life and they collapsed and they broke up and they produced material that was collected in a molecular cloud. And 4.56 billion years ago, part of this molecular cloud contracted, formed a gas cloud, a disk that rotated, and because contracted in the interior, formed a star. We can see this today in the sky. You know, there are star nurseries where literally hundreds of stars are being born uh, all the time. And that's when our sun formed. In our case, we can say precisely that that happened 4.5 billion years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'll get you. Three solar grains, um, this is the first I've ever heard of no, you find them only in the most primitive chondritic meteorites. Remember the ones with the chondrules and the CIs that have not been reheated. See, pre-solar cranes got into our own planet. They got into the moon, etc. But since our world melted, you know, our planet melted, they've been wiped out. There's nothing left. So you have to get to a rock that is as unadulterated, as pristine today as it was 4.5 billion years ago when this material was sprinkled in by 
someone. And uh, to give you a feeling for how much, some of these primitive meteorites contain a thousand parts per million. Point a part per million is a part in a million. Point one percent of pre-solar grades. So uh, others are very rare. And uh, yeah, that, that's the answer. Yes. Um, so 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 uh, uh, we're four and a half billion years old. Um, Actually, if I may interrupt, all the elements in your body were made in the interior of a star once. Probably in a supernova, a red giant, they got into a molecular cloud, they got into the solar system. So in a way, you know, you will live forever. When you pass away, all these elements get into the soil, it goes on again. When our solar system is kaput, uh, the cycle begins again, a new star forms, etc. Yeah, answer your question. I, I, I think this is a wonderful philosophy, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, my question is related to that. Um, so, so you know, this system we live in is four and a half billion years old. Um, from what I understand, the, we have fossil records of multicellular organisms that are three point eight. They go back to the yes. eight billion. Years. Yes. And Mr. Craig of Watson and Craig before he died wrote a little book in which he said that he didn't think there would have been enough time. You know, between four and a half and three point eight for life to have generated on Earth, and uh, um, the so facts argue question, against that. My question is, half a century with meteorites. You know, what do you think of that? Is, is there ever been any evidence? I mean, life's pretty fresh. Has there ever been any evidence? Uh, you know, uh, gathered or you know, from anything yeah. empirical relative to meteorites yeah. that might suggest the possibility? That, that somehow life could have Meteorites do not contain any traces of life. They contain organic material, highly organized or organic material. Some of them contain amino acids, porphyrins, but they formed from the solar nebula, this cloud here, at very low temperatures. The lowest temperature you get stuff like that condensing, not just water, but organic material. To answer your question, it is correct. We have a fossil record that goes 3.8 billion years or thereabouts. Uh, that does not mean life took from 4.5 to 3.8 to evolve because our planet had a very violent history. You see, early in the solar system, there were all these stray asteroids going around that impacted the Earth, some of them as big as Mars, which made our moon. And when this took place, all the, if there had been life, it would all have been wiped out. It would be vaporized. All the water probably disappeared, so you had to start from scratch. So, uh, and that cycle uh, actually uh, probably was at this highest about four billion years ago and then rapidly decayed. The planets had, uh, like a vacuum cleaner, gotten all the stray objects in space and then the uh, impact rate diminished considerably, and then life had a chance to evolve. But it, it may actually have evolved several times and was destroyed again by these giant impacts. Now the lunar, excuse me, the, the Martian, the Mars-sized impact that made the moon happened very early, probably 30 million years after 4.56. Okay, so early. I, I, uh, no, I think that's probably right. It's, it's possible that life formed earlier, but we have no trace of it because it may have been destroyed. It takes time for life to evolve. Here. You don't think? No, I don't think life was brought in. Why would it be brought in from somewhere else? It's just as difficult to make life somewhere else as it is here, <laughs> right? Well, I yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I tell you, it is. <laughs> yes. We do, uh, not, uh, I mean, the folks here with Penn Stars are our good Samaritans. They scan the sky and they determine the orbits of asteroids that are in Earth-crossing orbit. And they can do this, I believe, down to 100, kilome 100 meters in size. Uh, so eventually there will be a catalog of all the asteroids that are 100 meters 
in size or bigger with known orbits. And so you can predict if one hits or not. Uh, anything under 100 meters, unless it hits Maui, uh, is probably going to be not a big deal. You know, we've had historically impacts of that size that made a crater and a sizable crater and shook things up, but they wouldn't wipe out the civilization. A big asteroid like the one that killed the dinosaurs at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, that was probably a 10 mile, maybe 8 mile to 10 mile diameter asteroid. You know, that was a worldwide event. I mean, the oceans began to boil. Uh, the uh, acid rain due to the forests, worldwide forest fires, made SO2, you know, uh, acid rain happened, killed the organisms in the oceans. 95% of all the, the organisms in the oceans were killed 65 million years ago. Yeah. The energy that something like this happens, uh, carries, is just absolutely enormous. You know, all the atomic bombs in the world wouldn't do that. <laughs> Ten, ten, ten mile. Uh, I would say ten kilometers in diameter. A mile is one point six kilometers. Yeah, I, I think this lady here had her hands up first. <coughs> I was wondering how you tell when a meteorite comes from or else. Very good question. Uh, I was, in fact, one of the people who first recognized that one of the meteorites from the Antarctic came from the moon and not from asteroids. And the way we do this is, you know, we make thin slivers of these rocks and study them in the microscope, like Gary does here. And I compared them to lunar samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back, and they were dead ringers. It was, I mean, we had a meeting in Houston where all these people that worked on these strange things got together and everybody said the same thing. It's lunar, it's lunar, it's lunar. You know, it got boring. <laughs> so by comparison to Apollo samples, we can be sure. Mars is a little bit more complicated. I was involved in flying Viking, the spacecraft, the two spacecraft to the surface of Mars, a lander. We had an instrument on board. That's a different story. There was also a mass spectrometer on board, like one of those things that measures isotopes. And it measured the isotopes of nitrogen in the atmosphere of Mars, got a certain number, okay? When these meteorites fell on the Earth, so we knew what the atmosphere of Mars was like in terms of nitrogen isotopic makeup. When the first meteorites that were suspected to be of Martian origin came along, they contained about inch-sized globules of glass. That glass was produced by an impact on the planet. And it melted part of the rock, implanted some of the atmosphere into the rock and the glass quenched it in. So when we took out the glass from these meteorites and put it in a mass spectrometer and heated it up and melted it, lo and behold, the nitrogen isotopes were just like in the atmosphere of Mars. That's the very best argument. Yes, our young men. How often do they fall? Uh, Zillions a year. I mean, many, many thousands a year. The, the problem is the Earth is 75% oceans, so most of them fall in the ocean. 75% disappear, you never see them. Then there are many areas of the Earth that are deserts where there's no people, and so you don't, uh, you don't find those. The actual falls that are recovered every year is maybe a dozen or so, but there are many more coming down. And the smaller they get, the more abundant they are. You know, there's a rain of dust coming down from space all the time. Yes? So you, you said that the meteors that you study or that all fall on the Earth come from the asteroids that are within the solar system. Are there any meteors that are directly from something beyond the solar system? No. There was a time when, in fact, my predecessor, the institute director in, in Albuquerque, a man by the name of Lutz, he thought he had seen uh, meteors coming in at very, very high velocity. See, 
our solar system has a certain escape velocity, and in order to get out of the solar system or coming in, you have to come with that velocity, basically, very simply put. None of the, and Laplace thought he saw some that are not the case. We have no evidence that meteorites from outside our solar system have ever penetrated into our solar system and have been collected. So everything you collect is solar system material, except some of it contains material from outside the solar system, but no individual meteorites. There's also a big discussion, you know, what comets are, of course, you know, and comets decay, and some people thought there are some meteorites might come, come from comets. Possible, but uh, no, no really hard evidence. So it looks like most of the meteorites that come to us are either from asteroids, most of them, Mars or Moon. I've written a paper with a colleague trying to estimate why don't we have meteorites from Mercury? I mean, Venus is unlikely. It has that thick atmosphere. You never get anything out of that atmosphere by impact. Uh, but Mercury has no atmosphere. And uh, to make a long story short, we calculated that the probability of having a meteorite from Mercury is about half of the probability, did I say that right, of getting a meteorite. With other words, we would have to have a thousand Martian meteorites to get one meteorite to us from Mercury hmm. on statistical grounds. And since we have 50, I'm waiting for a <laughs> meteorite from Mercury, which would be sensational, of course. The question is, do we recognize it? You know, what would it look like? And we wrote in the paper, you know, what we think it might look like. You know, there's some spectral evidence for the makeup of the surface of Mercury. And uh, so that's a fascinating question. Yes. That's the reason that so few come, would come to us. Most of them would fall back into the sun, you know, because Mercury is so close to it. Very good. Yes. Uh, many uh, called carbonaceous Contrites, contrites like the ones that I showed you. Uh, in fact, uh, the one Allende uh, is a bit water bearing. Yes, they contain water, but not in liquid form, but bound into minerals. I don't know if you've heard of minerals like serpentine or chloride. They contain in the crystal structure water. And some of those meteorites contain up to 10% H2O heat them up and drive the water out. Now recently a very fantastic discovery has been made. They discovered inclusions in a silicate mineral which contained a liquid and that liquid actually was liquid water. I mean very sophisticated type work. So you know when the asteroids accreted in the right place they had ice accreting and when they were heated up a little bit by radioactive decay that ice became active and converted uh, minerals that don't ha have water into water-bearing phases, such as serpentine and so forth. You find this on the ocean floor all over. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, well, I heard uh, years ago that the moon they used up, uh, they formed from maybe somewhere in the Pacific? No, that's, yeah, you heard right. There was the son of Charles Taubin, George Taubin, proposed that. And that is definitely wrong, because the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean is only about 120 million years old. You see, it formed re recently, relatively recently. The Moon is four and a half, almost four and a half billion years old. So that's definitely not the case. It also would be impossible from a rotating Earth, a solid rotating Earth, to blow out a Moon. You know, gravity would hold that back. So the, uh, the most prominent hypothesis today is that about 30 million years after time zero, Mars-sized uh, uh, planet, what do you call it, hit our planet and vaporized a good portion of it, the mantle, the crust, the water, and that material got into orbit around the Earth, condensed back, and formed the Moon. And I tell you how lucky we are. If we did not have our moon, you and I would not be here. Why? The, moon, the Earth axis is rather stable. 
so that there is the climate difference between north and south and summer and winter and so forth rotating around. If the moon, and the moon stabilizes that orbit, that, that rotational axis, if the moon was not there, the axis of the moon, of the earth, and you wouldn't have life. You know, temperatures would change, everything would change. So, you know, whoever put together our planet really had something in mind. It was a very clever deal. You know, not only is it the right size, the right distance from the sun, uh, it melted, you know, we have continental drift, which makes ore deposits. It's cool enough that we have liquid water, we have ice, and uh, uh, we have vapor, water vapor. Very unusual for a planet that the temperature is just right so that we have H2O in these three forms. And it's very important for life on this planet. And then comes the moon that stabilizes our rotation axis. Someone very clever did this. Yes? I guess it's a gravitational energy that, that causes that. It's like the Milky Way is sort of flat, you know? Maybe you guys, astronomers, know more about this than I do. I'm not a geodynamicist, but uh, when these clouds collapse, they begin to rotate, and as they rotate, they form a central disk, and the material falls in from above and below. And in fact, we can, many of these contours and CEIs probably went through cycles of having formed at the cool part of the disk, falling inside, getting vaporized, the vapors go up, they condense back in again. So there may have been a cycle. Uh. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Did, did all the planets form at about the same size, time, or did the outside ones? Same time. Very much at the same time. In fact, what is astonishing to me is that the modelers say that a big planet like Jupiter formed within 30, 40, 50, 100 million years. I mean, it was of, of, or, or less of the formation of the solar system. Because you needed Jupiter to make the areas dynamically stable so that all the asteroids, etc., were conformed. i sorry, I didn't mean 100. Tens of millions of years, perhaps even less. So yeah, they formed at the same time. I mean, it's a miracle, you know, how these things happen. The human plants have weird yeah, same time, tens of millions of years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly the same time. Thank you for saying that. Did I see another hand here? Yeah. real basic, but I question it forever. Hubble took pictures of the edge of our universe. Close to it, I believe, yeah. Yeah. I think that age of 13, of the age of 13.7 billion years for the age of the solar system comes from, I believe it comes from Hubble observations of uh, very distant galaxies. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yeah. See, I'm not an astronomer, so you're getting me into, onto very thin ice. Uh. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So the probability is getting less and less, I mean, in a way. I mean, I, I wouldn't argue that there couldn't be life anywhere else. I, 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 nobody can argue that. Uh, there is a formula that, I forgot, Drake, the Drake formula, uh, where you can calculate, where he calculated the probability of life in other worlds. And there's a complicated input in it, you know, it's man-made. But the more we learn about the solar system and our Milky Way, the, the more 
you realize what a fortunate place our own planet is, you see. And, and you know, I could go on and on and on. These are not the only properties that are important. And uh, so, you know, you need some very, very special circumstances to have a planet that is rocky in the first place. I hate it when astronomers uh, speak of Earth-like planets around other uh, hate is the wrong word, but I don't think it's a good description of speaking of Earth-like planets rotating other stars. Rocky may be the right word, but Earth-like means it is a place that has plate tectonics, that has oceans, etc., etc. And that comes very, very late in the evolution uh, of, of a planet. I heard a talk at the Meteoritical Society meeting two weeks ago in New York where a person calculated the atmosphere that you would get by vaporizing uh, the, the continental crust of an of a extra solar Earth. Well, continental crust, for Christ's sake. You know, you have to have a very evolved planet to do that. Probably one that is, you know, the continents on our Earth are relatively young. The Earth wasn't born with ca uh, continents. To make North America, you granite, you had to make sediments first. They had to be buried into the deeper parts of the earth. They had to melt. They had to bring up granitic melt. Very, very long time consuming process. So I think we one should speak, and you said that right, uh, rocky planets. So. I'm confused though, because in response to my earlier question, you talked about uh, well, there could have been many evolutions of life here. Yes. But you know, the Earth was made, even the Earth even 4.5 billion years ago, except for the nature of the atmosphere, for uh, the number of impacts and so forth, was, was already a privileged place, you see. I mean, oxygen came later and so forth, but it was already a privileged place. So, I mean, I wouldn't put too much weight on what I said there, but it's possible that a lot of recycling has taken place on our planet. And it's certainly, when we talk about life, we're not talking about you and me. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think the Penn Star people here know more about this than I do. I, I've attended a couple of uh, 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 meetings, conferences, where you had very unusual people that I not usually talk to. You know, <laughs> uh, I mean people that make atomic bombs and spooks and all sorts of people. And, you know, they, they were talking about what you could do. You could send a bomb up and blow the damn thing up. Well, then you get, instead of being hit by one object, you get hit by a thousand, you know, a little smaller. You can probably notch it away from the planet if you know early enough and so forth. So there are remedies for that. And that's why I think the Penn Star folks are doing really wonderful stuff to catalog all these uh, uh, these objects that are in earth crossing orbits I mean we we really live in a dangerous world I mean you and I are have been around only for 10 million years you see or less so uh, the fact that we had this huge impact 65 million years ago seems rather distant but when you look at the impact craters on this planet we had an impact like the Cretaceous tertiary every Five million years, so we're due for one. <laughs> Thank God for pen stars. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate your interest.